So I'd like just to just open this last part of the afternoon by uh, saying we're delighted to welcome Professor Martin Blunt from Imperial College London. Um, I'm sure Martin's familiar to many of you um, for his research into multiphase flow and porous media. Um, and we're really thrilled he can uh, find the time to come and talk to us. His work integrates experimental, theoretical and numerical research, including imaging of pore systems and analysis of displacement processes, which has wide application to oil and gas recovery, um, geological carbon storage, contaminant transport and remediation of polluted aquifers. He has a PhD in theoretical physics from Cambridge University, has been Professor of Petroleum Engineering at Imperial College since 1999, before which he was Associate Professor of Petroleum Engineering at Stanford University and a research engineer at BP Sunbury. He's published over 250 scientific articles and in 2019 was elected to the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome him and to the Carbonate Forum and I hope you enjoy his presentation which is entitled Flow in Porous Materials, Tale of X-rays, Minimal Surfaces and Wettability. And over to you Martin. Hey well th thank you very much Cathy for that uh, lovely introduction and I'm delighted to be here at this forum. Um, I'm very impressed to see how many people are attending this meeting so um, I, hope, I hope you enjoy the presentation. A little bit uh, different style maybe from uh, some of the other talks you've heard today um, because my emphasis is not going to be so much on the, uh, the rock itself but the flow of fluids within the rock. So I'm going to start first of all by acknowledging my co-workers. Uh, we have the enormous good fortune to be able to attract some, uh, some truly great postdocs and uh, PhD students from all around the world at Imperial College. So I'd like to acknowledge them and essentially it's their magnificent work that I have the, the good fortune to present today. So I'm going to start straight away with uh, showing what, what we have. Okay, so if you look here and I will get out my laser pointer. Okay, this um, probably is familiar to you. This is a medical CT scanner using x-rays to look inside a uh, human beings. This has been adapted to look inside rocks. So you can look at rocks at the sort of person scale, so the sort of metre scale. But while that's interesting, it doesn't allow you to really look at the fundamentals of fluid flow, which are at the pore scale, at the micron level. Now, there's no problem with x-rays. They have the resolution, but you have to have a smaller sample. This is a sample that can be anywhere between 5 and 15 millimetres in diameter. And you place it close to an x-ray source and this provides you with a three-dimensional micron resolution of the rocks and the fluids within them. But there's something else. If you notice here, you say, well, that doesn't look like a piece of rock. It's sort of goldy coloured. What's going on there? That is actually a heating jacket. And if you look carefully, you can see some flow lines. What we do is within this small piece of rock, we reproduce the high temperatures and pressures that you'd see deep underground. And we perform a displacement experiment. So we have fluids moving in the pore space and we're taking these three-dimensional micron resolution images. While that's great, and we can do that in our own laboratory, the problem there is each image takes an hour or two. And you might say, well, if we're looking at flow processes, we can't really see the dynamics. So we can go to central synchrotron sources. This is where you accelerate an electron uh, near the speed of light and you get this very bright beam of x-rays. You see this, this beam is so bright it's ionizing the radiation, uh, ionizing the air, sorry, as it passes through and there's the sample. Don't worry, uh, all the students are safely in a control room. Um, and so you can take images every minute and in fact most recently we've managed to get down to a one second time resolution. So you can take these three-dimensional micron resolution images every second. So it's a bit like uh, having x-ray spectacles but in many ways better in the sense that you do get a three-dimensional image. So why? Now, it's clear from the introduction, um, we do do quite a lot of work on oil and gas production uh, and shale oil and gas. But actually, most of our work recently has been on CO2 storage. So as you're probably familiar with the concept, to collect CO2 from large point sources, and to inject it underground and to store it safely. And here's just an example of the scale of the problem. What's shown on the y-axis here is the amount of CO2 stored each year in gigatons, billions of tons of CO2. And the different uh, shading here are different scenarios of the future. We are um, in 2020, unfortunately, virtually near zero. Uh, 
But the idea is if we're going to deal with climate change, okay, we need to be more energy efficient. We need to have a rapid transition towards renewables, but we are still going to be generating CO2 from burning fossil fuels. And we need to put that CO2 underground. And what it will do is it will create an industry, if it takes off, the size of the current oil and gas industry, if not larger, for the obvious reason is we've obviously got to put all that CO2 underground to be net zero. So that is an enormous challenge, a huge societal challenge. And we need to do this storage properly, and we need to understand fundamentally what's happening. So it's not like oil and gas where there is a certain degree of we drill a well, oil comes out, people make money. Here, we're going to inject CO2, we need it to stay underground for tens of thousands of years. And we have to convince the skeptical public and regulators that we're doing it properly. So we really got to up our game scientifically. But it's not just geological materials. And I know this is a sedimentary uh, carbonate forum, but understanding flow in porous media has other applications. And in fact, the science itself is fascinating. So here's a fuel cell. This is part of a low carbon future. We store our energy as hydrogen and oxygen, and then we bring them together we react, react them together, we make water, and we generate electricity. Okay? But to do this, the gases need to move through a porous layer, right? essentially a fibrous porous layer. Um, the gases have to move in. We produce water, the water has to escape, otherwise everything gets clogged up. So you want good flow of both gas and water. By the end of the presentation, I'll show that some of the ideas that we've looked at for rocks will be able to tell us how to design the fuel cell efficiently. Then let's take some other examples, things that are maybe a little bit more current while we're in this extraordinary situation in the first place. Um, drug delivery, it's very important how you deliver the drugs in what phase, in what form, and use microfluidic devices um, to do this. And microfluidics is just a way of saying, looking at flow in porous media with pore sizes of microns. And then here we have a picture of um, someone wearing a surgical mask. Uh, probably as most people here are familiar with, I can only show you a picture um, because obviously it's difficult to, to get hold of a real surgical mask, uh, unfortunately, even if you're in a hospital. But how do those surgical masks work? Right? Um, lots of people are wearing them, and the idea is that maybe the general public should be wearing to protect them. How do they work? Well, you think they're a bit like a tissue. They just create a barrier to droplets, and that's true. But actually, they're porous, um, fibrous, porous materials that you want to trap uh, the viruses and the uh, bacteria um, in general, which are dissolved in water. So you want to stop water entering or going through this, these masks. So how do you design those masks? And again, at the end of this presentation, I'll show how the ideas applied to rocks can be used to the, to the design actually of improved respirators and masks, okay? So all of this involves the flow of uh, fluids in porous media, multi-phase flow in porous media. So what, what, what tools do we have? Well, the first one I've already said is uh, multi-scale imaging. We have a variety of techniques. I'm going to emphasize the X-ray techniques, but there are a variety of techniques that can look at porous materials and fluids from a resolution of around 10 microns upwards. Okay. We're also going to talk a little bit about modeling. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about modeling is, particularly in the 21st century, it's not just that we have fast computers, but we have public domain software that we can use, adapt. We don't just run other people's softwares. We adapt them, bring them back into the public domain. We can make very rapid progress in computational fluid dynamics as a consequence. And that's because of the algorithms are clever. So we're going to combine imaging experiments and modeling um, to understand what's going on. So let's start with an example. Let's start with a CO2 storage example. So here is the idea. We're going to inject CO2 into porous rock. And we're going to start with a sandstone, but don't worry, we'll get to carbonates on the next slide. Um, so here we inject the CO2, and the blue shows the CO2 that's connected through the pore space. And what that means is it can flow. Okay, the other colors are regions where the CO2 is surrounded by water, so it doesn't flow. But you look at this, you inject the CO2 underground, it can flow. So the concern is it does flow and it will eventually escape. But of course, the CO2 doesn't flow as one bubble. As it moves, it gets displaced by water. And so what you find here is that when it moves, essentially water displaces in the pore space. And you can see a lot of the pore space contains these trapped blobs. The different colors are just trapped blobs. So as it moves, it leaves behind most of the material. 
And so its movement in the subsurface is in fact quite limited. So what we have here, this is shown as a graph, as a trapping curve. This is the saturation of CO2 you put in. This is how much gets left behind. Obviously you can't leave before, behind more than you put in. Um, in this particular case, you got to about 50% and you've left behind about 30%. So 60% has been left behind. It's not that the other 40% is scant, the other 40% moves a bit further and then as it moves, it gets trapped. Okay, so it, it, it will all eventually get trapped. Um, here it is with just oil. With CO2, there is less trapping in this particular example, still significant. And the nice thing about these experiments is you can really see what's going on. You can actually see uh, it's just a fluke experiment. So the thing about these small scale experiments is that you can repeat them. Okay, so you can do another experiment and another one and another one and another one on the same rock. The thing you're going to notice is that the overall behavior, the amount of trapping is the same, but exactly where the CO2 gets trapped, which tends to be in the larger pores, is different from different experiments, even on the same piece of rock. Okay, so just bear that in mind, that's important for the modeling. Um, we've done it on another sandstone, we get the same behavior, and then as I said, carbonates, um, there was a feeling to begin with that with carbonates, say you've got a calcite, CaCO3, maybe in its interaction with CO2, actually that would be a wetting surface. The CO2 would like the carbonate surface. And as a consequence, the CO2 wouldn't be trapped in this way. In fact, the CO2 could remain continuous, essentially clinging to the surface. In fact, in our experiments, we took uh, two, in fact, we've taken a number of, um, these are quarry limestones, and we see again, generically the same type of trapping. Okay, the details may be different, but in repeat experiments on different materials, we saw a significant amount of trapping. And so we, we have some confidence that uh, the CO2 can be trapped in the pore space. But let's look at the dynamics of that, because that's just a snapshot at the end. How does the, how does the trapping occur? So here we have a synchrotron, a fast imaging experiment. Now I'm only shown, showing in uh, yellow. In this case, actually, it's an oil we're showing, not CO2. Um, I don't show the rock. This is image processing where I get rid of the rock and I'm not showing the water. So the water is the invisible fluid moving uh, from the bottom, okay, upwards like this. But what you can see, you can see this is on a loop. You can see the time here. It's not real time. Is that the water seems to move throughout the pore space and leave behind the oil stranded in the center of some of the larger pores. And this is over the scale of millimeters, but it's a phenomenon that will occur extensively throughout a storage reservoir or aquifer. So let's sort of zoom in and look at the dynamics there. What's, what's really going on? So that's this slide. So this is just a zoom in. Here the oil is shown in red, right? There's no particular significance to the color. So what we see here, and this is a repeated, is that the water can push out the oil or the CO2 so that's good for oil recovery, bad for CO2 storage. But then look what happens here. What we have here is a narrow region of the pore space. It's a water wet rock. The water actually likes the rock, okay? Not the oil or the CO2. And so the water can flow in wetting layers along the surface, swell here, and what's called snap off, actually break the connection of the non-wetting phase. And so this leads to a blob, a ganglion, of trapped oil in the pore space, and this is at the, the micron level. Um, the, the other thing here is just a fancy image analysis showing exactly the same video, but as you sort of swirl around, so it's a little bit more difficult to interpret. Okay, that's shown trapping, and that's, that's useful. But if you want to quantify what's going to happen with CO2 in the subsurface, or indeed oil flow for oil recovery, you need to do a little bit better than just say it's trapped. You want to know how does it flow and you want to quantify um, that and I'll, I'll show the relevant equations in a few moments. So the way in which we do this, and in fact this is traditional in oil industry, is you take a piece of rock and you start off with the rock, in this case it is oil and water, but it could be CO2 and water, with a high saturation of oil. And that's what you show here. It's a three-dimensional image, but uh, we're showing a two-dimensional cross-section. The red is oil, the water is shown in blue and the the, the, the oil is in all the larger pores. Then what you do is you increase what's called the fractional flow of water. So there, now you have 30% water, 70% oil flowing. Okay, so they're both flowing together. 
And so you can see there's more water in the pore space. And you can measure the pressure drop across the sample. And from the fractional flow and the pressure drop, you can actually find essentially the relationship between flow rate and pressure gradient, which is encapsulated in a function called the relative permeability. It shows essentially how the flow is blocked due to the presence of the other phases. So you can increase the fractional flow until it goes to one. And then what's represented here is the oil trapped in the pore space. And we know all about that. OK, and we can also, because we got these images, we can quantify the saturation. We know, relatively speaking, how much oil and water we have. And we can also do some clever things. We can look at the interfacial areas. We can even look at the curvature of the interface between the two phases. Here is this capillary number actually represents a balance of viscous to capillary forces. So this is slow flow. This is slightly more rapid flow. Looks similar, but if you're eagle eyed, you can see here there are a few regions that are yellow. And what that means is during the hour long time it takes to do this scan, some pores are filled with water, some with oil, and they sort of flip flop between. So you begin to see some dynamic effects. So what we call this is micro CT rock analysis. Um, this is again on a sandstone, um, but we will be showing some carbonates in a bit. OK, so the first thing we can do is we can measure the curvatures of the interface and things can be curved in two different directions. So this is R1 and R2, the two curvatures. The capillary pressure, which is the pressure difference between the phases, the interfacial tension times that curvature. So this is what we measure, shown in the color. This is the capillary pressure against saturation. These are measurements. This is drainage and then imbibition on a larger sample done in a traditional fashion. You might say, well, our measurements don't seem that marvelous, but actually they're particularly good at looking at low capillary pressures. Whereas traditional measurements are actually quite good at these endpoints, but not so good here. We'll show that later. Then we have this relative permeability. Here's the equation, the multi-phase Darcy law. This is the flow rate of a phase is proportional to the pressure gradient, the permeability of viscosity, but there's this relative permeability function of saturation. This is the oil relative permeability. This is the water relative permeability. And uh, those measurements are classic water wet behavior, very similar to what's seen in, in other measurements, again, done in more conventional ways without the pore scale imaging. But now we get to the sort of second major theme of today's lecture, which is, okay, that's fine. But certainly most oil reservoirs, the oil has been sitting underground in the pore in the pore space for geologic time. And it has altered the wettability because some surface compact, surface active components of the oil can adhere to the solid surface. Okay, so that's what would happen. The other thing for CO2 storage that is relevant is the first place, in fact, at the moment, we're not exactly on zero when I showed how much CO2 storage we're doing, but the first place people could think of doing it is in fact to put the CO2 in depleted um, oil fields. Um, the reason is we know that it's a good geological trap. We've got the injection infrastructure. And although it's not helping save the planet, there may be an additional um, economic benefit of improved oil recovery. Actually, CO2 is, is fantastic for sweeping oil out of the reservoir. OK, so in fact, many places where we're going to begin the CO2 storage, we're probably going to be injecting into reservoirs that are actually not completely uh, water wet. So what about mixed wettability? So if it's mixed wet, what this means is you get some regions that are water wet, but some regions have become more oily. The oil tends to reside in smaller pores now. So the, the water wet is shown in blue, the mixed wet in, uh, in uh, red. OK, so the oil relative permeability is lower. That's what you'd expect. You trap less oil. And the reason is because now the oil is clinging to the surface or in layers, and so it can move more, yeah, it can move. The interesting thing though is the water relative permeability it ends up higher, as you might expect, goes in some of the big pores, but it stays quite low here. So we're going to look at that in more detail. The capillary pressure we measure, the traditional measurement is a bust. Basically, you say it's around zero. Um, what we see is a very low capillary pressure. So that's interesting. Low capillary pressure, low water relative permeability. Uh, that, that's a little strange. So let's let's investigate that in a little bit more detail and let's move straight on to carbonates. So here is a reservoir carbonate um, from the Middle East that has been in contact with crude oil from the same reservoir. And you can see immediately when I flood with water, the water's in blue again. Um, now we see the water tends to go in the big pore spaces, okay? And the oil is clinging to the smaller pore spaces near the surface. And here sort of in a layer, there's water here, water here in the corners and oil in between, okay? 
So let's actually sort of get to grips with this idea of wettability. What do we mean by wettability? Strictly speaking, what it is, it's the angle that the brine will make. The brine is shown, or the, the water is shown here in this gray, uh, the oil is in black. The angle measured through the brine when it contacts the solid, okay? So we see here that we get in contact angles that are greater than 90 degrees. So actually now it's the brine that goes in the big pores that is a non-wetting phase. Before we move any further, okay, you might say, oh, Abu Dhabi, Middle East, oil, industry, this all sounds a bit, you know, secret. Um, one of the main triumphs here in this particular technology is we do share our images, actually. Um, these images are all in the public domain, okay? The papers that we published are open access, and indeed even the codes, which I'm going to get to next, um, are all, again, uh, in the public domain. So um, although there's some things we have to be sensitive with, one nice thing is that we have data and we do share it. Okay, so let's let's look a little bit about what we do with contact angle and wettability, because that's that's basically the continuing theme now of uh, this uh, presentation. So this is a limestone I'm showing here, Ketan Neolithic uh, limestone. So um, it's not a reservoir sample. This is just for illustrative purposes. So we're sort of this is an experiment. We're zooming through the pore space, and what we're showing here is again not oil. This is CO two trapped in the pore space, and and we're looking at a scale here of about two millimeters. Okay. The different colours are just the different trapped blobs. There's no significance to be attached to the colours. Okay. And then we can select a single blob just to illustrate exactly what we mean by contact angle. So here um, we're going through, this is actually the raw image, CO2 here, water here, uh, rock shown in red in this particular case. Okay. So the contact angle is defined at what's called the three-phase contact line, where the two fluid phases, CO2 and water, contact the solid, okay, and that's shown by the yellow line. And then the contact angle is determined by taking a plane perpendicular to this line and finding the angle um, at which the fluids reach the surface, okay. And this sort of lot of zooming around and fancy image processing, we've been able to do this now automatically. So we can in fact um, have an algorithm, which I, I gave you the, the uh, link to, um, that finds the contact angle. And for those of you who know a bit of physical chemistry, um, in fact, what we have here is the black is the CO2. This is the brine. Traditionally, actually, we measure the contact angle theta um, through the uh, brine phase. And you can see a contact angle about 45 degrees. And that represents something that's water wet. The CO2 is non-wetting, even on a calcite surface. Okay, and that, and again, confirms everything we've been saying before. But now, let's whiz straight back to oil recovery. Um, may not be the principal interest here, but it, it's, gonna, it's gonna help us with some of the other things uh, that comes right at the end of the presentation. So here are the raw images. Each of these images is eight billion voxels. Okay, they're three-dimensional images. Here they are shown segmented. So we start with a rock that's virtually all full of oil. Um, there is water in some of the small pores, and then there are actually pores that are submicron that we can't see, and most of those are actually filled with water. So it's not that there's no water. Then we start injecting water, and when we have a fractional flow of one, you can see the pore space looks completely blue. So immediately you look at this and say, this looks good for oil recovery. Pretty bad for storage, if that was CO2, most of the CO2 could get flushed out, but great for uh, storage here. So why is this? Well, sorry, great for recovery. Why is this? So we can zoom in and we can look at the water. And the water is a bit curious. So the water in this carbonate is in the microporosity, can flow, but it doesn't flow very readily because the microporosity is small pores. So when we start injecting water, and now I need to get back to my laser pointer. Okay. When we start going through, start injecting water, what happens is the water will want to move into some of the big pores because actually it's not wetting anymore. It's sort of wetting in the microporosity, but in the big pores, it's non-wetting. So it, it finds a blob in the big pore. So that's what it's doing, the water saturation increases. Look at that picture, different colors are disconnected blobs. It can still flow through the microporosity, but really slowly. It's like trying to, you know, drive around a city, but then it, all the roads are blocked and then you have to get out of your car and walk along the pavement, right? It really restricts the flow. It doesn't stop you completely, but it restricts the flow. You start injecting more water. You can see the water starts to connect through the big uh, pores. Here it's sort of, there's a blue cluster that almost goes across the sample. Eventually, the water does fill most of the rock and is well connected and that looks good. But for a wide saturation region, the water's held back. So what does this mean in terms of the relative permeability? Exactly what we saw, actually, funnily enough, in that sandstone sample is 
quite a low water relative permeability. The oil relative permeability is also low, not much trapping. This actually is good for recovery. It means that we can basically have oil flowing more readily than water until quite a high saturation. So that allows us when we inject water, it's basically oil that's being produced, not water. And so that's good for recovery. And it's because the water is held back in the pore space. Okay? So this is actually tells us something about recovery. But you might say, well, why? Why do we see this? I mean, you've been talking about contact angles. And this is zero curvature. What, what's going on here? Okay, this is quite interesting. Okay, that when we have a water wet medium, what's shown here in this picture is the interface, the meniscus between the oil and water. And oil bulges out into water. So they form a sort of ball shape. And we've got some plasticine here, right? It's ball shaped. Now, when you do this, you have curvature, basically sort of equal and opposite curvature on both sides, okay? And that's what you expect. And that means the oil goes into balls, it gets trapped, right? Or the CO2 gets trapped. Okay, bad for recovery, good for storage. If we have a mixed wet sample, we see something a bit mysterious. The average curvature is close to zero, but it's not because we have a flat, flat interface. It's because the interface is curved in one direction, right, in a positive way, and in the other direction in an opposite way. So it's, it's sort of something that's sort of dumbbell shaped, right, sort of round like this and then curve the other way. Now, you might say, okay, fair enough, so what? Um, these are what's known as minimal surfaces. And they are in fact, mathematically what you see if you pin the interface and you minimize um, uh, interfacial energy. And why would you pin an interface? Well, because you've changed the wettability. So when you change the wettability, the contact between oil and water in the solid can't move until you reach a sort of oil wet contact angle. The, the water doesn't like moving over the surface. So most of these contacts are pinned. So then you get these minimal surfaces. You get a zero capillary. Okay, so what? Well, minimal surfaces turns out has been a bit of a um, mathematical topic of interest, right? It's the sort of thing that pure mathematicians get terribly excited about um, for a couple of hundred years, ever since the time of uh, Euler and Gauss. And so you see them in lots of examples. Here, here is a good example. Imagine you've got two, two rings and you have a soap bubble between them. Um, there's air in here, there's air in here. There's no pressure difference across that film. It's not flat though. So what this is, it's what's known as a catenoid. A catenary is the shape that if you have a wire that hangs under gravity. And a catenoid is when you rotate that shape. And there's reasons why they're, they're similar uh, physically. Um, it's where you have equal and opposite curvatures. So there's a curvature here and a curvature here, but they're in different, different orientations, right? One's concave, one's convex. The uh, average curvature is zero. But the Gaussian curvature, the product of the two is negative. One is positive, one's negative. And what that means is something with a negative Gaussian curvature is well connected. Look at this. Imagine we had oil in the center here, water here. Nothing's bull shaped, nothing's getting trapped. Here's another. Um, minimal surface, a helicoid, that's sort of like this, you can imagine oil and water on either side. So something with a negative Gaussian curvature, something with these minimal surfaces, also maintains connectivity. You don't, you only trap things when you wrap a surface round and it's enclosed. That requires a positive Gaussian curvature. So this is a topological origin for why you're seeing good oil recoveries. Bad for storage, good for recovery. And so, now, I don't want to say too much. I want to obviously have some time for, for, for questions and talk about modeling. But we're beginning to get now a complete characterization of flow and porous media from fundamental principles, which is we're looking, turns out there are these Minkowski functionals, which provide a complete geometric description of multiphase flow and porous media. Volume, which is saturation, interfacial areas, curvature, which gives us capillary pressure and Gaussian curvature. We also are measuring wettability with these contact angles, but it turns out we can also do a, an energy balance to find the wettability dis consistent with the, dis the displacement we see. And that actually is a relationship between air changes in areas, kappa is the curvature, changes in saturation. And so we can relate these things together to quantify wettability. And of course, we're measuring the flow, so we're measuring relative permeability. And that helps develop new theories 
right, helps quantify new theories of multi-phase framework smoothing. But that's not all. We also see these dynamic effects, which I talked about before. This is a synchrotron image, which seems like uh, it's a synchrotron image where we've got gas and water flowing. Um, and it seems like it's flashing a lot. What's going on? What it's that showing is just the connectivity of the gas. And it shows that even when you have gas and water flowing continuously, there's big changes in connectivity. And what this leads to is that at very low flow rates, it doesn't make much difference. We have a linear relationship between pressure gradient and uh, flow rate or capillary number. But when you start getting this a significant amount of this, this dynamic or intermittent behavior, we see a non-linear relationship. The Darcy law basically doesn't hold anymore. And that we start seeing that actually quite low flow rates. And the reason is here is at very low flow rates, this is the oil, the non-wetting phase. It follows this really tortuous pathway through the pore space, just filling the larger pores. But only could take this shortcut, be so much more efficient for flow, but there isn't the energy for it. I increase the flow rate, lo and behold, there's the energy to make the shortcut. The oil makes the shortcut. Don't worry about the other bits of oil. They're not really contributing to the flow in any event, but it's periodic. Sometime later, 10 minutes later, shortcut's gone. It's like traffic controlled by traffic lights. You know, you can go down the main roads, but your house is just there. So if you just wait at the traffic lights and take this little shortcut down a narrow road, you get there much faster. It's exactly what's happening here. So very briefly, um, I also want to talk about modeling because it's all very well doing this imaging, but then in the end, people want to model, they want equations, they want things they can do to make predictions and to design um, recovery or storage processes. So actually, we've got a reasonably good understanding of some, some straightforward things. Um, if it's a water wet rock, even before we had this imaging, um, or at least we just had imaging of the pore space, we did have a good idea of the physics. So here, um, is an example. Here are some classic measurements of relative permeability primary drainage when I inject water to displace oil. Here is when water, water dis, sorry, inject oil to displace water. And then here is water to displace oil. And we trap, this is the residual oil saturation here. And we have a model, what's called a network model, we'll get to that in the next slide, that predicts the, the behavior um, very accurately. But there are two problems. One is the scale problem. So particularly if we're looking at carbonates, so here's an Estiolardis carbonate, here I've zoomed in, actually this is Keton, these are these oolithic grains, and then if we go submicron and these is with um, electron microscopy, not x-rays, we can see that we got pore sizes that are a fraction of a micron. So we get this huge range of pore size that we need to, to um, accomplish. The second one is going to be wettability, which, we're going to, which again has been the theme, and we'll introduce uh, how we do it in the modeling in the next step. So what we do is we know what called this pore network modeling. We represent the pore space topologically as wide regions called pores, narrow regions where things snap off, which are the throats. We don't literally account for them as balls and cylinders. In fact, what we can do is we calibrate the effective properties to match what we see from our imaging experiments. And also we can do what's known as direct simulation. We could do com computational fluid dynamic simulations to look at the pore scale physics and incorporate that. Okay, and that enables us then to look at a range of length scales and a range of uh, physical properties. Okay, so let's talk about modeling and reproducibility. So here's an example. We started right at the beginning, we did these trapping experiments and we repeated them and we got the same average behavior, but not exactly the same fluid occupancy. So this is an example here. This is the pore size distribution in one experiment to the next, there's a discrepancy and it tends to be in the medium size pores. Um, the water always goes in the small pores, the oil or the CO2 in the large pores, but repeated experiments um, is the medium sized pores. What you want is you want a model that gives you as good a reproducibility as we see between repeat experiments. So it's as though I have a model or a repeat experiment and you can't tell the difference between them. They're not gonna exactly reproduce your first experiment, but there shouldn't be any systematic errors. If we um, have limestones, um, what's shown here is the discrepancy um, is a little bit larger. So it goes up to 27% here. Um, between uh, sandstones, it's around up to 15%. Okay. So that's what we do in our pore scale modeling. And we can extend it now to include the effects of wettability. So what we do is we do this energy balance, these fancy stuff with Minkowski functionals to 
estimate the average wettability of the pool space, which in this particular example is about 100 degrees. So it's slightly um, oil wet, slightly non-wetting to water. But in fact, we know that the contact angle varies from place to place. We can measure this geometrically, but this is often this pinned angle, so it's not quite what we want in our models. We want the right angle for a displacement. So what we do is we vary the contact angle pore by pore just to get the filling sequence right. So we can we've measured the order in which things fill, so we get the filling sequence right. And we can get the discrepancy between the experiment and the model really very low, and in fact lower than you might uh, see between repeat experiments. So this looks great. And then once you do that, you can actually predict the fluid properties very accurately. And now you have a model that can look at different cases, it can look at different wettabilities, it can look at um, different, different uh, displacement processes. So here, the water wet case, here we have the capillary pressure, the green curve is the one that, that we're looking at, and the others are when we have different guesses of contact angle. But, but this is the physically based contact angle. Here's the relative permeabilities we showed before. The solid lines are now the model, and that goes for the data. For the mixed wet case, more challenging, we see this low capillary pressure within the errors of the data, um, but we can also extrapolate to the endpoints so we can get the higher capillary pressures. And again, the relative permeabilities are predicted quite accurately. So, um, what we find, right, when we're able to look at it, uh, displacement is more dynamic, um, and so there are some challenges here for our traditional models. We're uncovering new features, particularly this idea of this mixed wet state and a sort of topological origin of good oil recoveries. But more generally, we've developed this sort of microfluidics measurement technique um, that we can really look for a variety of problems. Okay, so we're always sort of trying to establish here a science of flow in porous media that's not totally linked to a specific application. And I think that's important, it's very good for the community. Um, we have tended to sort of, I'm a petroleum engineer, I work on oil, and oh yeah, I do Darcy's Law as a niche, or I'm a hydrologist, and yeah, there's Darcy's Law, but we don't want to talk to people from other disciplines. What we're really doing here is introducing a, a much more rigorous framework um, in which we can all collaborate together and solve important problems. Um, in terms of the modeling, we're not really trying to, to encapsulate every little piece of the physics, but we have these beautiful experiments that we can use to calibrate and validate our models. Okay, so it's gonna lead, hopefully, to better design of oil recovery in carbon dioxide storage or indeed harnessing groundwater resources. Um, but what about the two problems I showed before? Now, this is a busy slide. I'm not expecting at the end of uh, this um, seminar for you to understand everything, but what about surgical masks and fuel cells, right? So can we apply these ideas to other things? Well, the fuel cells is interesting. Um, you wanted a state where water goes out, gas goes in over a wide saturation range. What's gonna work? Mixed wettability. Turns out that these fibrous materials are indeed a mix of oily fibers, basically plastic fibers, um, and uh, water wet fibers. So that's done empirically. People sort of, oh yeah, let's try, it seems to work. Now we have a rational way of designing it. You know, what's the optimum? We, we actually have some good ideas of what the optimum um, wettability state would be. So rather than doing it empirically and then you know, worrying about the electrochemistry, which is also important, and that's where most people focus their efforts, you can have a sort of porous medium specialist who actually gets that what's called a gas diffusion layer um, to have optimal properties. But before we go any further, we'll get quickly to the surgical mask, just a moment. Something a little bit wrong there it was, yeah, but that was gas water, not oil water. So if you say it's oil wet, it's a plastic surface that likes oil. How do I know it likes gas, right? Is that right? Well, it turns out, and I'm not gonna go through the equations, but you can derive a rather nice relationship between the wettability, the contact angle between oil and water, and gas and water. And it turns out, but if you have a water wet condition, if something is wetting to water in the presence of oil, it's also wetting in the presence of gas. That sort of makes sense, right? You know, tissue soaks up water, right? Yeah, you got it. The more and more interesting thing is an oil wet rock or oil wet porous medium. If it's oil wet, that is, it likes oil, it will also, can also be um, essentially non-wetting to water, which means it repels water I mean, think it's likes gas sounds a bit weird, but what it means is it repels water. The water is forced into droplets 
okay? So now we get to the surgical masks, right? Okay, it's a bit of a physical barrier, but actually you don't want those droplets into the mask. What do you make the mask out of? You make them out of polypropylene fibers. Polypropylene is, uh, is obviously a plastic, it's oil wet, it repels water. And in fact, the design of proper respirators, there is a capillary pressure barrier for the water to go in. So even if there's a spurt of water, it resists that water. Exactly the same reason why ducks stay wet, uh, stay, stay dry, stay, uh, stay warm and dry, right? They've got these porous feathers, they have an oil gland, they keep their feathers oily. It prevents, it's a, it really prevents the water from entering, um, entering their feathers, and so they have this insulating layer of air around them. Um, not quite the whole story for surgical masks. Um, the problem here is that obviously viruses are tiny uh, and they can be airborne in tiny aerosols which are submicron. And what that does is it gets through the mesh. And you can't make the mesh finer because then you can't breathe through the mask. So what you do is you also have a layer that's water wet because that will attract the tiniest droplets to the fibers. Okay? So you have alternating layers of basically water repellent, oil wet in our terminology, and water attractive uh, layers. And again, you could think about using our ideas of wettability to design um, a respirator, for instance, that has optimal properties. So that's where I'm going to finish. Um, does it matter? We have a whole range of applications, and I agree, I seem to have maybe drifted a little bit off topic, um, but actually I think that's what makes this field so exciting. And I will just finish here by acknowledging uh, the sponsors. Okay, so um, I'm going to plug my book, um, but my book was written a couple of years ago, and lots of these ideas actually are, are much more recent than that. Um, so. So that's actually makes, again, it makes it exciting. We do uh, receive quite a lot of money from the oil industry. I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Qatar Petroleum and Shell, who's helped establish our labs. And in fact, they were funding us both for oil recovery research and also for CO2 storage. So um, I'd like to finish there and hopefully there's plenty of time for questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. That's fantastic. And uh, lots and lots to think about um, from, from lots of different areas as well, and very topical as well, covering surgical masks, which is why we're all online at the moment. Um, okay, the chat is open. If there's any questions, um, they're all starting to come in. So uh, um, I will start. There's uh, um, a question just come in from Franek Hasek. Um, he says, are you saying that the Minkowski functionals are the minimum number of parameters to accurately define the geometry of a 3D pore structure? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, right? Um, I'm not a pure mathematician, so I've got to be a little bit cautious, but apparently there is a theorem, Erdiger's theorem, that says that any additive geometric property of an object um, is described by these Minkowski functionals. The caveat here is that it doesn't necessarily describe a flow property. So, for instance, relative permeability, although it's informed by these functionals, it's not, you can't prove that it's a unique function of those. But any geometric property, apparently, yes. Thank you. Um, ben Bayer Song, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, is it are you able to calculate directional permeability in a digital rock? And secondly, is it possible to print a 3D digital rock and compare flow behavior to software um, calculations and experiments? Um, okay, but the, the answer to, to those, uh, both questions is yes, but you know, uh, we don't do everything. So directional permeability, definitely. So if you look at this sample, you can see just by II, there's likely to be, um, you know, poor permeability for flow in this direction, maybe okay this way, maybe okay this way, okay? So we can calculate actually a permeability tensor. That's, that's easy from digital rocks, so that's a good feature. When it comes to 3D printing, the answer is yes, you can do 3D printing of um, rock structures. Um, however, we have not done that at Imperial. I know that the Harriet Watt group are doing it. Um, it it's extremely good because then you can have reproducible porous materials. Um, that you can use and it's also great for micromodel experiments. So in principle, yes, it just is not something that we have done though. Thank you. Um, just whilst we see if any more questions are coming in, um, 
just uh, one from me. Uh, you talked a lot about pore size um, and wettability, um, and you did touch on topology, but I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how important you think pore shape is and also pore throat diameter and controlling um, some of the trapping um, uh, features that you were talking about for CO2 and for oil. Yes, so um, theoretically you can look at this. So clearly the um, most trapping, in fact, it's sort of self-evident um, from, our, from our video here, you're going to get most trapping when these pore throats are as thin as possible compared to the pore bodies. Okay, that's the so-called aspect ratio. You also want the pores to be quite angular because where does that, how is the water flowing? The water is flowing in the corners of the pore space. So you actually want a rough pore space, right? A smoother pore space um, isn't going to be so favorable for trapping. In terms of wettability, this is a little bit more interesting. So one thing I didn't have time to mention, but it is, it is pertinent to maybe what you say about trapping is that when you certainly get mixed wettability, it turns out that, okay, we make good predictions, but the contact angle is not randomly assigned. This distribution has a correlation. It's a spatial correlation. So oil wet regions tend to clump together. And these large contact angles are, tend to be associated with the larger pores. So larger pores tend to be more oil wet. The smaller regions tend to retain, because they have more water actually, the end of primary drainage is the hypothesis, tend to be more water wet. So all of this would tend, Cathy, to, to indicate that you tend to get more trapping in regions where you have, well, I would say, small rough pore spaces. Okay, the, the, those would be the facilitators of trapping. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, okay, there's a question here from Eva Dravid, um, saying, again, very interesting talk, very nice presentation. Um, have you contrasted different carbonate fabrics in your modeling? For example, uh, um, Sucrosic dolomite, so a sort of crystalline dolomite dominated by microporosity um, and poor throats versus a macroporous fuzzy carbonate. Um, we have done some work looking at the pore size distributions and the nature of the relative permeabilities, but not much, certainly not in terms of this calibrated model. Um, what we tend to find is if you have a single pore class, Right? even with a relatively wide um, distribution, you tend to get this sort of mixed wet type behavior, which I've just shown. Where you begin to see different behavior, actually where um, it's not really mixed wet, it's more oil wet, so you get much uh, better, water, much faster water flow, is where you have different pore systems and say a buggy pore system that's connected. So in terms of the multi-phase flow behavior, it's, it's where you have these buggy, buggy pores that rapidly connect and they tend to be they can be quite oil wet and then you get very different relative permeability characteristics from what we've shown before but we haven't looked at this systematically at, at, at the moment thank you um question from astrid arts um does co2 behave differently when it's a liquid versus a supercritical liquid okay um good question so in our experiments the co2 has always been a supercritical fluid so we've been at temperatures and pressures beyond the critical point. You're right, you can have CO2 as a gaseous phase. Um, there, it will tend to behave actually um, a bit like a sort of nitrogen water system. Uh, in many cases, actually, the trapping behavior is similar. Liquid CO2, we have not studied, right? So that's relatively cold, high pressure CO2. So I can't comment on that. I know other groups have looked at liquid CO2, um, but, but we, we haven't um, um, done for our experiments. Excellent. Um, okay, Joyce Nielsen, um, she's asking, given the complex nature of carbonate pore systems, how good will they actually be for CO2 storage compared to plastics? Um, my, I mean, again, you know, I'm basing it on the experiments we've done here. Actually, it, okay, they're very complex pore systems, there's no doubt about that. But certainly if we're looking at aquifer storage, we have a wide range of pore size. This actually, um, it was Cathy's uh, previous question and comment, um, would facilitate trapping. So in the, the, in the samples we've looked at, as long as we're water wet, we actually do get significant trapping. And so I'm not terribly concerned actually that, that carbonates, just because they're complex actually, that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. Uh, there are other things you need to, to be worried about, obviously fracturing, 
uh, there's chemical reaction as well, dissolution. Um, and we have studied dissolution processes in carbonates. I just didn't have time to describe it today. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out carbonate uh, systems just because of their complexity. That, that doesn't actually stop you trapping, actually. Many, often it can help. Um, another question from Ben Bao, again, um, comes back to digital rock resolution um, uh, analysis is resolution dependent um, and carbonate rocks are extremely heterogeneous as we've been talking about um, with poor radiuses ranging from 0.1 of a micron to tens of microns. So how do you choose the best modeling size? Yeah, now that is a very good question, very pertinent. Um, so it's a challenge for imaging. So we can, we can quantify saturation in microprosity by doing what's known as differential imaging. So we can saturate entirely with our high contrast brine and uh, then with a dry scan and we can, we can get the porosity and the relative saturation from images. When it comes to modeling, you do need an explicit description of the pore space. So that means there is a trade-off. You can't, you can't do one experiment and do everything, right? You can't take one image. So what you have to do is you have to take a larger scale image that with a few micron resolution for the macroporosity. Then you have to identify microporous regions. You can do nano scanning or you can do FIBSEM, so electron microscopy techniques. And then you have to combine them, you know, in the way that I've sort of described here schematically. So this, this would be a description of microporosity and sort of linked into the macroporosity. But, but I, I agree, it is challenging. My, my recommendation actually, as I think pore scale network modeling viewed as an upscale representation of the pore space is possibly the best way of dealing, dealing with this challenge. But sometimes what we have to do is we have to do direct simulation at the small scale to give effective properties. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, again, one of the, the big questions we have with all of this. I think um, <laughs> we actually capture all of that. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, there's no doubt. It's, it's a challenge to have genuinely predictive models. I, I'm, so I think that, that there's always going to be a problem there. I think in terms of, does that mean that we can't really say anything about carbonate systems? No, I disagree with that. We have, you know, as we showed, we've got a reservoir carbonate, right? Um, which was one of the last ones here. You know, this is, this is a reservoir carbonate, okay, with microprosity. I agree, it's a nice carbonate sample in the sense that it's got several hundred milliadarsis porosity. No one's complaining in Abu Dhabi about forward production from this, uh, from, from this formation, obviously. Um, question from Fiona Whitaker. Um, she said, Thanks, Martin. Um, given that over time there will be dissolution of the gaseous CO2 within the fluid, and then the fluid will interact chemically with carbonate surfaces, does this cause a systematic evolution of the behaviour of the system with respect to fluid flow via wettability or permeability due to that dissolution? That is an excellent question. So, um, in fact, people have, uh, again, it's not uh, been groups at Stanford have looked at this. So in fact, there is, there is a subtlety. So, you know, the CO2 gets trapped, but obviously it can also dissolve. Now, you normally assume that you've got so much CO2 that actually you saturate, you reach saturation, but it's a little bit more subtle than that. So you can actually have some rearrangement of the blobs, um, but it's thought that the time scales and length scales are such that that isn't going to affect uh, the storage capacity. When it comes to dissolution, Again, it's quite likely that the, the whole system gets saturated relatively quickly because, again, you've got very large length scales and you, you need diffusive processes uh, to get out of equilibrium. Um, however, the dissolution, if you start water wet, probably isn't going to change the wettability. It's going to stay water wet. What's more interesting is if you have an altered wettability surface. What's going to happen there? Does, does, the, does the acidic brine dissolve away the surface active components? Does it make it more water wet? Does it actually only dissolve away the water wet fractions of the pore space? We simply don't know. Um, I'm actually, I, I don't know, but I would think for a water wet system, I think we're okay. It will stay water wet. Um, and there's a question, a question that follows on from that, I guess, um, from Angus Fotherby that says, uh, again, thanks for a fascinating talk. Could you elaborate how this, um, work direct selecting real world sites for CCS and how you might geochemically amend sites to make them more suitable for carbon storage. Okay, so how would you select the storage sites? I think this is one component of it. I mean, you can do, you can do an assessment of capillary trapping, which is basically what we're doing here. Um, 
Geochemically, again, you can try doing dissolution experiments. Um, obviously, you don't want sites uh, with significant dissolution that might compromise, say, any cat rock. Um, but in terms of site selection, I think this is, this is really my piece in here is really to quantify the relative permeabilities and the uh, degree of capillary trapping. Okay, and then you put that into a larger scale model. So I think this work could be used as a component. I don't think it's the only, it's not the only thing, I mean, for instance, we're not considering um, what happens in terms of the pressure response to the reservoir either. Um, but I think it is a component that you could use this, you know, you assess permeability, relative permeability, and uh, the residual saturation, and, and that's something that you then put into a larger scale model. Thank you. Um, and one more question um, from Mumtaz Mohammed. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, in complex uh, diagenetic uh, modification of carbonate rocks, where there are multiple phases um, of, of, of multiple diagenetic phases, how do these modify the pore geometry and network, and how can CT modeling contribute towards a better quantification of pores? So I guess this is going back to the question of yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, imaging again. I agree. This technology is quite new. Okay, so we haven't really, at this stage, haven't been able to do a systematic study there. But yes, we would expect different types of pore structure, and we haven't yet really, really looked at how that's going to change the dynamics. Um, you can also potentially get different wettabilities as well, and that's something you also see in sandstones. So you'd see a mineralogically um, heterogeneous rock that then could lead to a heterogeneous wettability distribution. Um, possibly even wider ranges of wettability or content angle than we see here. So my, my view here is the answer is I think this technology has a lot to offer because we can image the pore space and the fluids within them and we can then begin to do more sophisticated things like identify um, you know, displacement patterns, pore occupancy, not just in terms of pore size, which is what we do at the moment, but actually in terms of uh, pore structure right, and the, the diagenetic type or the mineralogy. Um, and we're beginning to do that, but I haven't done it in the systematics sense yet. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Dirk Alderman, um, he says, thanks for the great talk. What about the con concept of CCUS, um, carbonate capture and storage in microporous shales, even with the idea of additional enhanced ore recovery? CO2 might be trapped in the pore systems, but can a CO2 gas fluid with its low relative permeability easily penetrate water wet microporous systems? And can this be done economically? I don't know. Um, actually, that's a research project uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about uh, looking at. Um, you're right, there is, there is a uh, possibility of storing CO2 in microporous shales, right? Because as, as, as quite rightly pointed out, um, you know, the CO2 hopefully will be able to penetrate those shales. It might actually encourage fracturing, which again, as long as it doesn't allow the CO2 to escape, um, uh, you know, is, is not catastrophic because actually it aids injectivity um, and it might help aid additional hydrocarbon production. So I think that's a fascinating topic, right? Because we've got plenty of shale. And so there is a possibility here that uh, shale reserves could, um, could actually be, um, a big store, you know, provide a lot of storage potential. It's some, something at the moment, I think, uh, where we're not, we're not sure, um, but it's something that's worthwhile investigating. Fantastic. That seems like a really good place to stop because we're almost out of time. Um, and uh, I think that's given us plenty to think about. That's a, a fantastic talk. And thanks uh, coming through on the chat as well for um, the illustrations and um, something that's really thought provoking. So thank you very much again, Martin. I really enjoyed that. Um, well, thank, thank, thank you, Cathy. Thank, thank you for the questions. Yeah, if anyone has any other questions, um, then they can contact, contact me by um, email. You can find my email address at Imperial or just by Googling my name. So uh, anyway, thank you. Brilliant.